kick off. Brilliant. So tonight at Active Travel Cafe, I'm delighted that uh, we're going to welcome Adam Transfer, the former Walking and Cycling Commissioner from West Midlands, but there's many other strings to his bow as our main speaker. Uh, we will kick off as usual with our, a little crowdsource news roundup. So wherever you are in the, in the UK or even abroad, always great to hear if there's any news near you. Um, and uh, we will finish probably around six o'clock this evening as we've only got one speaker. Uh, a reminder, do post your questions in the chat and uh, please keep comments in the chat largely confined to the talk while our speaker is speaking. So I think that's it for now. Um, and without further ado, I think I'll kick off the kind of newsy section and see if anyone has any news to share. I've got a couple of thoughts on things I've seen this week, but it'd be great to hear. Uh, oh, we've got Beth from Torbay. And I think Torbay might be a new addition to Active Travel Cafe. Have we heard from you before, Beth? Um, just, just the once. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm Beth. I um, run an organisation called Safe Sustainable Travel Torbay now. Um, and I become the bike mayor of Torbay. Uh, so news from Torbay is that we are currently consulting on the draft um, local transport plan which is Devon and Torbay um, so if anyone else is in the Devon region and wants to touch base with me that would be great um, I've had some really great input already because at the moment it's just like vague statements so people have um, given me some help with that already um, I've also got some pretty um, big issues with kind of um, a massive project which has had planning go through and terrible infrastructure so that, that's something that I'm working on um with a critical danger highlighted by active travel england but the local authority have approved the the plans um and my concern is that active travel england aren't going to fund future things so i'm trying to get the council to realize that we need to try and play a better game um and then so if anyone's got any advice that's always welcome and on a side note i'm actually looking to set up maybe something of um a community enterprise or an enterprise myself where I go and kind of audit um, active travel and particularly cycling facilities um, for businesses and um, and then maybe make recommendations and apply for grant funding. And if anyone's got any um, experience or any business models or business plans they can send to me, I'll put my email in the ch chat and that'd be great. But yeah, I'll shut up now. Brilliant. Thanks, Beth. And um, uh, oh. this is a great place to get uh, tips and advice. So do um, do if you're present and have something to share with Beth, please do. Um, Robin. Hi. So um, national news. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the road safety statistics came out for the, uh, the country. And uh, one thing I've started doing last year and done this year now is the what kills whom analysis that was first done by uh, Bob Davis, who was one of the co-founders of Ideas with Beers that became Active Travel Cafe um, to analyze what the impacting vehicles were rather than just the um, rather than just the victims in uh, road crashes. And um, if I can I put up a slide to show the results of that? Yeah, you should be able um, to. Uh, uh, yeah, good. Um, so that is the results for the latest. Um, and you won't be surprised to see that uh, it's cars mostly implicated, which is not a complete surprise, but um, uh, of course, cars are the highest volume traffic as well, as Bob reminds us, always look at the rate. Um, and I think one thing that's uh, uh, people always look at how much the cycle is involved in this. Well, four pedestrians were killed in cycle collisions in 2023. Um, the, uh, all the data are there. I will post these two slides in the chat. The um, other one I have done is to look at the uh, rates uh, because you can get the uh, traffic uh, vehicle miles. And uh, you can see from that that um, the looking at the other road user fatalities in other words the fatalities and the people that were collided into the the rate for cars is two and a half times that for pedal cycles you might be surprised it's only two and a half but it is two and a half but you've got to consider that cycles are usually cycled in the most dense 
uh, urban environments and cars are often driven on motorways and A roads with not many people around. Uh, and then look at motorcycles and that's three times the numbers for cars, which is uh, quite a shocker. Uh, and of course, HGVs and buses are higher because if they hit you, they tend to kill you. Uh, and so uh, there we are. I can, I, I've got it set up so I can replicate that for any local authority, transport authority or police force area if uh, people ask me nicely enough. Uh, that sounds, you already to have. Like you're, sounds to me like you're taking requests there, Robin. So um, <laughs> I am. If you, if you pop that down, um, we've still got your screen up there. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, on the road safety point, yeah, it's interesting, wasn't it, hearing Lillian Greenwood speak last week, I think it was. She, I think, is the minister who potentially be leading that national road safety strategy, although it's um, not heard much news on that. That's, that's underway. I spoke spoke to somebody who was there, and the, it's it's proceeding in the right direction, but it's it's taking inputs from everybody at the moment, so it's early stages. Thanks for that extra insight. Right, we'll have Roger then, Mark. Uh, yep. Hi. Thanks. Um, yeah, a couple of other bits of national news. Yes, there was a parliamentary question where they uh, acknowledged they haven't actually got a time scale. The government hasn't got a time scale for um, public any kind of public consultation on the load, uh, on the road safety strategy. They're having stakeholder dialogues. Um, so yes, not sure what's not sure sure what's going in. I, I suspect my former cycling cycling UK colleagues might know more than I do. Um, I just wanted to match a couple of other couple of other things. One of which would be relevant for sorry, I've lost the name of the bicycle mayor from Torbay but um, as Low Trap Future Alliance we Beth. have uh, Beth hi um, and this this is one I have mentioned before so I'll do it very quickly but Low Trap Future Alliance we have produced both a summary guide and a slightly longer fuller guide to what to look for in a good local transport plan as basically a glossy four page or a longer 24 pager and I'll ping a link to that in the chat in a sec. We've also produced a thing called a uh, transport choices challenge which is basically for all the local authorities that haven't actually consulted on or finalized a local transport plan yet it's an invitation for them to sign up at bronze silver or gold levels depending on what level of ambition they want uh, they, they feel they can aim for and no shame in aiming for bronze for if you're a particularly if you're a more rural authority and you really don't quite know what funding you're going to get because they're all in that situation but we just want the more local authorities who who, who want to achieve high you know good traffic reduction targets even if they're not sure they can actually achieve them we'd love them to sign up so that's the point of the bronze silver and gold um uh, structure i'll again i'll ping a link to that um in the chat sorry for that being a rather brief explanation but do encourage your local authorities to sign up to it um the the last one is that um we're, we're looking to influence the government's planning reforms because the government's planning reforms is basically they've started out on the basis that they need to build 1.5 million homes and try and minimize but not avoid taking green belt land in doing so and they really haven't thought about any other environmental issues apart from green belt land they're just trying to up, not upset the nature lobby and haven't thought about anything anything like sustainable transport um, the idea that they might need to build higher density homes with not too much car parking and with good public transport connectivity if they if if they really mean what they say about building the right homes in the right places that's a phrase that politicians of all parties always use and they never define what they mean so we've tried to do so um, we've come up with this concept of close-knit communities places where where um, you're close to the things you want to be able to get to. Uh, think 15 minute neighborhoods, only it, um, only it does sound like, you know, 15 minute neighborhoods had the problem that no one knew what they meant to start with. So it was very easy for the troublemakers to invent their own wrong definition. Close knit communities rather more self evidently that's a good thing, surely, um, being close to where you live, uh, having less uh, car dependence, because people on less busy streets have more friends and neighbourhoods in their neighbourhoods. So that's also close knit. Uh, uh, do write to your MP calling for support for close knit communities. Again, I will ping a link in the chat. OK. Thanks, Roger. And then we'll go Mark and then uh, Jill. Yeah, just a couple of things on. First of all, Beth's uh, comment. I'd suggest you look at um, uh, Mode Shift because they do this. They offer Mode Shift is the travel plan organization and they offer this. And not trying to dissuade you, but they're, they're already doing that as a charity. 
So you might find yourself coming up against somebody else who's already auditing. And they, they issue, as Roger said, gold, um, gold, silver, and bronze stars. And again, there's no shame in bronze, but they do businesses, workplaces, travel plan, um, you know, uh, hospitals, et cetera. So, but maybe they want somebody to work for them. So it might be worth talking to them. Um, the other is I won't name the name of the organization um, I'm referring to. Uh, Ranty was helping me at the meeting earlier. But there's a council we're working with on bike share schemes who insist that they need traffic orders for bike share parking on footways. And we're trying to tell them they definitely don't. Um, if any of you have got bike share schemes in your area and have noticed traffic orders for parking on pavements, it would be useful to know. Although the absence, proof of absence isn't proof that you don't need it. But we're trying to gather some evidence that you don't need it. And I'm sure Roger knows very well about all the traffic order stuff, having done all that stuff for the Cycling UK in the past. But anyone else as well would be really helpful. Sorry, um, Jill, we'll go to you now. Looks like you're live outside your house in Stevenage. <laughs> yeah, sort of in conservatory. Summoned out here. Um, okay, so I said something a couple of weeks ago, I think, about what some work we were doing with a local retail park um, where we've got a change of use going on for another shop that is now going to be sort of small things that you can easily pop along and get on a bike. And we've realized we've done a bit of an audit of it, and we've realized that the infrastructure to get into the park, into the retail park and across it hasn't changed since it was literally just a home base, a big toy shop, and a um, furniture store so we've done a whole lot of stuff on that but in this we're sort of writing to the actual owners of the retail park as well as talking to the council and councillors and I've noticed that there are these retail parks all over the country um, so the list is Derby, Newbury, Northampton, Preston, Shrewsbury, Stevenage, Worthing and York so I put that list in the chat and if anybody is in any of those towns um, and wants to take a look at what we've done in, in our nine yards um, retail park um, it would be really good to sort of, um, you know, say is it numbers and actually sort of talk to them and say, look, you know, this could well be something going on across the country. We're going to sort of push them to have a look at Stevenage because, of course, we've got the amazing infrastructure around it, which makes the fact you can't get across it even worse. Um, but, yeah, so it just seemed an opportunity tonight to mention that. So I put the list in the chat and I've also put our campaign email address. So if anybody is running any sort of campaigning work in any of those towns, it'd be brilliant to hear from you. Thanks, Jill. And um, lastly, we'll, we'll go to Adrian and then um, we'll wrap it up there. And if anyone's got any more, do post them in the chat. Um, thank you. Adrian. Hi, thanks. Yeah, just to say that uh, about 10 days ago, uh, 2020 had a, a webinar, which I think quite a lot of you came to, actually. Um, extraordinarily, we had over 500 people watching this webinar. So there's there's something something changed. Uh, it could be, a, could be a general election or something. If you if you didn't get a chance to watch it, um, there was about we had four speakers from different local authorities, Cambridge, Oxfordshire, Surrey, and Cornwall, all explaining how they are doing twenty miles an hour, not whether how they're doing it. And I'll post a link to the video in the chat. That's fantastic. Um, it was very good. Adrian. Yeah, and. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to post in the chat about any particular points they found useful, I'm sure anyone who wasn't there would find that useful. Um, just a couple of things I was going to mention before we go to Adam. Um, one was there was um interesting news story, it might have even been today or yesterday, the AA calling for graduated driver licences. And I think this has been in the news because of the inquest on that horrific crash in Snowdonia um, came, finally came happened last week but interesting the AA are calling for graduated driving licenses I hadn't seen that before um lots of news stories about fuel duty at the moment which obviously with the government saying they need to um try and uh invest while still saving money they've got to figure out where that money's going to come from so been really interesting to see we've got the spending review next week and so we active travel cafe are on a break next week so the one where we come back which will be the 5th of november there'll be lots to talk about in terms of that spending review and um bus stop bypass is also in the news bbc breakfast did a big piece i think this was because there was some sort of round table event the house of commons and um i thought their piece was 
quite balanced and um, explored the issues. They had some uh, footage of uh, pedestrians being being hit by people on bikes, but that wasn't, you know, the tone of the piece wasn't um, sensational. So those are just three things I spotted. I'll put the links to those in the chat. Um, okay. Oh, and someone's posted a, a link to a petition there. Thanks, Will. So, yeah, I think we will now um, move out of the news section, but the chat is still there, to into our main speaker section. And I'm delighted to welcome Adam Tranter, who um, most of you assume know, but if you don't, was the former Walking and Cycling Commissioner for West Midlands. Um, as I said, he has got many other strings to the bow, which I'm sure he might touch on. Um, he's got a sort of marketing background and was involved in the um, Bike is Best campaign, you know, and the, the best tool for the job campaign, talking about how bikes are, you know, the best tool for the job. So delighted to welcome back Adam. We had him on when he was walking and cycling commissioner. So I'd be interested to, to compare and contrast perhaps with what he was saying. And uh, so I'll I'll hand to you now, Adam. It would be great if you just introduce a little bit about yourself, where you are now, and perhaps your take on on the state of play, shall we say, with active travel. Um, I've then got a few questions we'll go into, and then we'll open up for questions from the from the floor. Great. No, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I know many of you, and uh, it's great to see some new faces as well. Um, the active travel cafe appears to be a significant part of my life because um, when I got my new job uh, I came here and I said all about it and now that I've left it I'm coming to tell you all, all about it so um, uh, lots of um, you know lots of, of, of people I've worked with and engaged with here um, and, and uh, great to see yeah a lot, lot of enthusiasm and knowledge sharing which is funny enough as commissioner one of the things that I thought was most important uh, actually, um, sharing knowledge between councils, authorities, um, nationally experts, and giving people the confidence to to do um, stuff that that might have felt hard at the time, but um, was was definitely the right thing to do. So, um, for those that don't know me, I'll, I'll uh, resist the temptation to give you my uh, life story, but the the sort of uh, too long didn't read version is that I um, grew up cycling, wanted to be a racing cyclist was rubbish, um, uh, didn't go to university, struggled basically in writing about cycling, then setting up a marketing business about cycling um, at a point where then cycling became sort of vaguely interesting and popular to, to, to people outside of kind of the enthusiasts uh, core. Um, I still do that. Um, I still run the business, although it's larger and more kind of mainstream now. Um, and uh, I went from, you know, riding around um, uh, recreationally to when my kids were born to, to doing the, you know, and you'll heard this before from people like Chris Borman, that, you know, his kids sort of saying, can I cycle to school? And me sort of going, well, no, not really. Um, and then I, um, I finally got around, I got a cargo bike. And when I got to school, people thought I was like from the future um, and they were like, wow, what's that? Asking me all these questions. Um, and my wife and I set up a school cycle bus. Um, and then I started to message our auntie highwaymen about why why like roundabouts near where I live were designed for people to carry speed and thought it was it was wrong. Um, and, and slowly became kind of, um, I guess, a little bit radicalized uh, in this stuff to the point where I campaigned. Um, and I, um, one of the people I campaigned to was the, the then mayor of the West Midlands, Andy Street. Um, and eventually, after lots of campaigning and a kind of coordinated campaign around his elections, where he agreed and and uh, to hire a cycling walking commissioner, um, he effectively said, "Well, you know, stop moaning, go on then." Um, and uh, I, uh, I I did for for, for two and a half years. Um, so. Um, Ultimately, working as cycling walking commissioner was, you know, I think probably one of the 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 best and uh, worst jobs in the in the world, and sometimes even on the same day. Um, it, it's a it's an incredibly challenging role because I think it, when done in the way that I envisaged uh, the role, um, you are you are sometimes single handedly trying to uh, use. Uh, your influence and the mayor's influence to change a system that frankly does not work 
to deliver um, the kind of change that we need um, in the kind of way that we need it. Um, so you feel like you are, um, you know, pushing water uphill uh, and you feel like uh, sometimes it is you versus the, the the world. Now, I don't want to give a bad impression. I had lots of very brilliant, supportive, um, tenacious colleagues, everyone all um, wanted to, to, to do the right thing and make change. But ultimately, we've, you know, over many, many years, even in a system as new as the one adopted by a, you know, a combined authority created in 2017, had got to a point where we'd over-engineered the system and uh, forgot what it is that we actually need to be to, to be doing in, in transport. Um, so I, I became very um, passionate about how to make change uh, and how to unpick a system to make it work. I wasn't super interested in being like a champion for stuff. Like, I, you know, I probably inadvertently did it. Um, but, you know, and I, I was great when I didn't know something, I'd go and learn about it. Like, uh, you know, I, by my own admission, I was probably a little bit dismissive of some of the behavior change initiatives uh, over infrastructure. So going to like learn about them was really interesting. Um, but I think there was a misconception in an executive level that this kind of role should be about telling people how great cycling is. Uh, and actually my perspective was, well, cycling is great, walking is great, um, but at the moment no one's going to do it because you look out the window and it looks awful. Um, why would why would they do it? Um, so we need to, to, to change that. Um, I want to just um, mention as well, like, yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not really a political animal. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in politics. I'm not a part, I've never been a member of a political party or active or anything like that. Um, but I had genuinely the most supportive um, and courageous um, uh, boss um, in, in Andy Street. Um, he, uh, he backed me to the hilt every single time I needed it. Uh, and in some cases that was, you know, there were some considerable moments where, you know, in, in topics that are really difficult, like road, road harm reduction, when people are losing their lives on the roads where you know you're calling out a system that does not work you know people do not like that and um there was a lot of heat on on, on the situation so to have that support to tackle a, a system um was was super important and i think mission critical to 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 do the to do the job um i think i left it in a in a in a good place uh, i kind of left it in a point where um there's still so much to do i wouldn't even go almost like the point where you look at it and go well, was it was it even effective because the the scale of change is so great um but um uh, you know i think i was the i was the one thing i did champion and cheerleader was was not the concept generally but the funding so you know we managed to get 254 million pounds out of the the city region sustainable transport settlement of over a billion pounds allocated to schemes that significantly improve active travel but it sort of relied on me being there all the time and sort of shaking my head when people said, could we cut it uh, and and uh, fighting for that budget? Because, of course, there are lots of pressures in, in overrunning um, uh, transport schemes. But I think that that kind of earmarking of like, actually, we're going to take this seriously. It's not just something we do. It's actually a significant part combined with the vision of, of, of the officers who develop things like the local transport plan um, was was a really um, uh, was a really good thing. Um, I think also uh, one of the things I really focused on, and some people said I was too focused on the detail, but one of the details I thought was really important is the quality of scheme design because it stands for as a metaphor of what what you value and what you um, what good looks like, and also what the benchmark is for everyone else to beat. Uh, and we had a lot of good into rivalry between local authorities. Um, I worked with Phil Jones, many of you will know, who was my uh, technical advisor. It was really helpful and really powerful to have Phil on board because um, effectively you had these sort of slightly awkward, I'm paraphrasing for a fact, but you had these sort of slightly awkward conversations where people would say, well, no, that's not that's not how, how LTA 120 should be. And then I say, well, this guy wrote it. So like he thinks it's like this um, and, and or this is how it should be interpreted. Um, and I I think uh, that was really well received, actually. A lot of ambitious 
officers, a lot of graduates uh, in the sector as well, certainly in the black country, where they were really eager to learn and develop really good stuff. So um, actually, you know, if you can't get this stuff right now in like 2023, 2024, then then what hope do we do we have? So um, really lifting the technical capability up, uh, I thought was was a good use of time um, and ultimately led us to things like getting a very good capability score, one of the highest in the country um, uh, with active travel, uh, active travel England. Um, it also, uh, my job was, you know, to say all about delivery and, and, and processes as well. Um, you know, even the actual, the literal government did not sometimes understand how local authorities would deliver schemes and the processes they would need to go to. So, you know, we would be able to, um, we would say to the government, we would like to build a cycle lane for seven million pounds, please. And the government would say, yes, please do. Here's the money. And they'd literally wire the money into the, the bank account, you know, when the funding uh, deadline came through. It's a couple of pages to sign, but I was always amazed that you only had to, officers only had to sign like eight pages of things to get that much money to go and do something. And then the government would sort of be like, well, it'll be done in a year, won't it? You know, and 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 there's this kind of charades where everyone at the local authority knows it takes about three years to deliver a scheme like this, and everyone at the government thinks it takes a year, and you get into this paperwork process of constantly getting date extensions and timeline extensions and and, and whatever. So um, I don't want to go into too much detail on that unless it becomes interesting later. But the 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 kind of important bit of that is that the system actually you know, was not working the way that it was intended to. Local authorities were spending a lot of time submitting paperwork to the government who would take a lot of time to reply. By the time they replied, the deadline they were asking for the extension on had surpassed anyway. Um, and you're in this kind of circle of not actually getting onto what you need to do. So um, really looking at that, it was it was, it was was really important to get right because you just cannot build it if the foundations are, are, are not right. And I hope that some of them are in a better place um, right now. Um, it also very, very visibly became about um, road danger reduction. Um, and uh, because of, of many uh, horrific and uh, frankly avoidable um, deaths on the West Midlands roads. And um, I could not, I could not let that, you know, go unchallenged. Um, not naive enough to know that to think I could single-handedly fix an issue uh, like that, but knew enough that we had to get everybody in the room to acknowledge that there was a problem and that we needed to do something about it. Um, and um, uh, I think, again, Andy Street was very supportive on that. I, I effectively wrote a letter to the chief constable, to the directors of, of the local authorities, the police and crime commissioner with a, this ain't good enough from all of us. Um, and and uh, that led to a, a series of um, uh, a series of uh, important meetings. And uh, the police very command and control. The police are very good when they focus on things. They run gold meetings where they do it with counterterrorism. They do it with things that are live issues. And they treated the road safety um, issues as a as a genuine emergency. Um, but it was very clear how much you need to unpick to start to make that uh, make that change but I do at least hope that um, uh, it is now acknowledged as, a, as an issue and there are systems in place to take this seriously um, and uh, yeah I guess in summary I, I love doing this job but I, I felt very closely supported and, and um, aligned not necessarily party politically but aligned with the backing of Andy street uh, and when he lost by by 1500 votes and i think it's probably testament to his approach that as a conservative mayoral candidate in a in a bit where that party is really not doing well compared to to, to labor was only lost by 1500 votes in the west midlands i think i think that sort of shows his wider uh, wider appeal um but you know unfortunately when when andy was not coming back i i really looked and go could could I go and do this fight day in, day out without that support, without knowing I had that support? Um, and the answer, the answer was 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 no, unfortunately. 
Um, and here I am. So, um, uh, you know, I, I still have a, a business, an agency, um, I'm founder, and we do marketing, communication, a bit of public affairs, stuff like that in the psych industry. Um, and uh, I'm simultaneously enjoying not having as much pressure on my shoulders, frankly, um, but also the kind of void about making a difference that's led me to filling in forms about bad parking and potholes. Um, so I do still need to have that change making bit uh, in me uh, to stay sane. Oh, thanks, Adam. Um, so much to pick up there. And um, um, thank you for, you know, sharing quite honestly and, and got lots of comments coming in via the chat. There's already a few sort of particular themes. Um, perhaps I can start, though, by just for the record, kind of getting getting you to say why you why you decided to resign from the role and and also as has been posted in the chat, you know, people have seen that there is now a new role being advertised, um, what your take on that is. So yeah, that we'll start with those. Uh, yeah, so um, I mean, the, as I kind of alluded to with this role, it is really, um, shouldn't be, but it was really one individual versus the um, versus the, the 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 system in many ways, and it shouldn't have felt like that. And maybe some of the some of the the, the things I could have done better was to 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 make it a, a little bit more um, uh, kind of one team collegiately trying to reach a larger goal. But ultimately, I was interested in making it change, making change. We had lots of money on the table and a very tight window of political opportunity to make a difference and I, I felt that like ruffling a few feathers um was was probably uh probably worth it um that said as i as i alluded to there are there were instances where frankly people wished i wasn't doing this job and 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 <laughs> made it clear so um and and it was the boss it was the mayor that, that stood up and said no he's right and and it's going to be right um, we'll come around to realizing that 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 this is the canary in the coal in the coal mine, um, and that support in an organisation like that. You know, I'm not from the public sector. This is not a lifelong career for me. It was to make change. Uh, was was overwhelming and so important to be effective. And people have to believe you're speaking for the boss. First thing that Andrew Gilligan told Chris Borman, and the first thing that Chris Borman told me is you've got to have access to the to to the to the money to the cash to be able to get good schemes and 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 reward good schemes uh, and you've got to be speaking for the boss um and that was really uh, really important um frankly during the gen during the election campaign for the mayor elections every candidate was asked if they would reappoint the cycling walking commissioner and the current mayor did not give a sufficient answer i don't think he thought about it i don't Think he, you know, he's as strong on this as um, the, the the former mayor. So the the, the prospect of um, going into the office on a Monday morning when all your mayoral team, because I was the mayor cycling walking mission, I was appointed by the mayor, worked in the mayor's office, having all your all your colleagues with their boxes <laughs> leaving, and me staying. I, I I possibly, you know, very much would have done it if there was that real drive to say look this is going to be a top priority for us i want to see you on day one or at least week one or something like that but it but it wasn't to be so that's why um that's why i decided to to, to go um i saw a question um i say I, I decided to go i decided to go and also offered to help you know them with any kind of advice or transition that they need that i get either wasn't necessary or didn't happen but um very mindful i did not just want to to kind of late leave something I was very passionate about. Um, uh, it's unclear whether the role that they're recruiting for is is a a road safety commissioner or a cycling and walking commissioner, or if it's the same thing, whether it's two roles or one. Um, and and as I say, when I resigned, the line was, "We're not going to rehire. We're going to see what's going on." And then a couple of days later, they felt I think a bit of pressure on them to, to to do that so they did say the mayor said i'm going to hire a new cycling walking commissioner um so it's hard to know if this is that 
or this is a road a road safety commissioner or road danger reduction hopefully um commissioner um but i can't see i mean i'm trying to find the diplomatic way of saying it but i can't see a world where you can get a good candidate to unpick an entire system of inertia where we just accept road, either road deaths is inevitable or we you know accept uh, or we don't deliver at the pace that we need to deliver on a vol you know effectively a voluntary basis um reporting not even directly to the mayor but a task force probably of various politicians of varying interest levels uh, on this um i i just can't you know you someone said someone much smarter than me said something like you know you 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 value a, a a city not based on what it what it says but what it's in its budget um and if you value you know if you value it to that level then it's going to be really i think really challenging to find someone good you might i might be wrong i hope i'm wrong um and i hope they find somebody that can can do it you know, for free and put loads of time into it. But in in a in a you know, one of the criticisms I had was that I was another white man doing this. And if you want to find a way to really uh, make sure that your candidate represents the true diversity of the West Midlands and and uh, get more women in transport talking about this, which I think would be brilliant. Very unlikely to be able to do that if you're not paying any money, or even if it's not unlikely, it's probably not moral to to, yeah. to do it either unfortunately and so building on that a question from uh from neil and it sort of picks up on others um in the chat which is so how would you change the brief for the success for the walking and cycling commission if you could reinvent it and let's say it wasn't you but it was someone else what what, what would it be what would the brief be in the and the yeah i think time? i think it's yeah i think it's important to um give people the time to work on this stuff there's a lot of relationships that need to be built that done in a short space of time or done only when there is a real emergency can you know become very transactional and, and adversarial um, a lot of the best success I think we had was with politicians that I'd spent time building a relationship with and and they would you know they would hear me out or they would um, you know they would that would um yeah be bold uh on on stuff so um i think you have to allocate the time to be able to do that and if you want to allocate the time i think you probably have to pay for people's time it's sort of just a basic concept so um i i i think that would be be a key one i think there's some thinking in this actually just to be fair um the new commissioner according to the media will report into some form of newly formed task force um i actually for what it's worth think that having a certain level of formal governance um in that post can be helpful um you know uh, effectively having somebody of importance get to a meeting that is on the public record and say you know, this is what's happening, this is what needs to, you know, there's a level of scrutiny that I think is is good. Um, I tended to work with the the media to be able to have that level of of of, of scrutiny because I wasn't formally called to to uh, very rarely formally called to, to meetings and stuff. I was, you know, working directly for the mayor. Um so I think that's actually quite quite a positive thing. But again, if you're gonna make change the the new mayor would need to be very clear that this person is appointed on his authority and uh it is a you know a critical issue that that he wants to 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 get right um because there are a lot of competing demands and and people can see through whether you're trying it on or whether this is genuinely a, a priority for the for the organization mm -hmm. um so there would be there would be a couple of things um i think it's interesting actually about how it could work across Across, um, this is something I noticed actually across the country, tends to be combined authorities appointing commissioners. And, and yes, the local authorities go along with it, but actually it would be powerful if the local authorities and said, actually, we're going to not, they, they supported it, but actually put it into their own governance as well for that, for that scrutiny. That would be, that would be interesting. And, and maybe even within 
uh, the PCC's office or Westminster Police, like if it's a road danger reduction commissioner, for example, then then maybe this is an, a joint appointment with the with with the police or at least the scrutiny of the police and crime commissioner, so that you know poli roads policing is a huge part of of road danger reduction. So maybe that scrutiny would be would be helpful. Mm. And <clears throat> there are lots of questions on this um, about commissioners, but. I don't know if this question's too big, but so we talked there about the brief for the commissioner, but in terms of the, if you could sort of wave a magic wand and, and the issues that you kept coming up against that, I mean, you described the sort of system as broken and it was like you against the system. And like, if you, if you were to, I don't know, negate the need for a commissioner or what were the things that you would fix just if you could wave that magic wand? Yeah, I, I would always want to negate the need for a commissioner. Um, that was my sole purpose. Um, that that was quite a good icebreaker, but it was like, I either want to be fired for being too bold or made redundant for being too effective. And neither of those, either of those things in the middle, like it won't just, it won't cut it. So it has to be one of those two things. Um, and uh, I, I think to answer the, 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 the question about the system, um, and this is something I think is very relevant to national government at the moment, which I'm trying to portray to, 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 to those that will listen. Um, you have to decide what you want to achieve. You have to state what you want to achieve. You have to have, and this is why this missions approach from the new government is actually, I think, quite welcome. And then you have to make sure that every single policy is super simple. You just have to make sure every policy you ask a question with a straight face and you say, does this help us get us closer or further away from this stated aim? Wales did it in a really good way, right? Like Wales is saying, we're going to hit net zero by whenever we want to reduce this amount of vehicle miles because of that net zero target. Um, and then they ask the question of like, does building this massive dual carriageway help or hinder that goal? And, and the answer was simple enough that people like me could understand it. And, and they would go, fine, then we won't do that uh, uh, effectively. So you need to change the system so that the system operates without you. So uh, I think anything from how the treasury appraise schemes, um, you know, uh, valuing journey time savings, uh, all of these uh, kind of things that, that don't meet our actual objectives or goals that are stated. Um, you need to kind of build that checks and balances. And someone who knows how systems work better than I will will find a way to achieve that. Um, but I was very struck when I went to go and see, uh, I think Groningen in the, in the Netherlands, and they said, yeah, when we had our new administration, they created a rule and it said, like, stop doing stupid stuff. So if, if, there, was, if there was a scheme on the table that was funded and it, didn't meet their objectives and it was going to create more congestion or, or whatever they, they they stopped doing it um so I, I think very much that is how you get those checks and balances right and then i actually think we've ripped all the trust out of the the, the public sector we've ripped all the um there's a lot of very good people uh, who want to do the right thing and i think we've kind of drained that out of them um you know the sort of taxpayers alliance vibe and, and all of this stuff what sandwiches shall I order so we don't get in the meat in the press um, and, and whatever? I'm exaggerating, but but only a little bit. Um, you know the 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 idea that uh, everything has to be business cased to even exist. So let me just give you one example of what I've changed. Um, when the government says here's your seven million pound for a cycle scheme, at the point that I started, local authorities who had basically no staff because they'd all been chopped through budget cuts had to then get to a point where they had to write an eight page business case to get the funding that the government had already said it wanted to give and was already in the bank account. So they would have to hire a consultant to write the business case within how many staff. They had to write a business case to hire the consultant with money they did not have. Uh, and then you, uh, you get to the point where eventually, you know, six to nine months later, you think you've won because your business case has been approved. But all it is is to unlock the money that the government said you could already have. Um, and then you've got to start actually thinking about what scheme you deliver. And by the time you do that, inflation's at 10 percent. 
a war in Ukraine where you get your your, your concrete or whatever. Um, and uh, you know, there's a there's a real uh, there's a real issue there. And then all of a sudden, you can't finish your scheme because the costs are overrun. So I would try and make that process, and I did try and make that process simpler, where local authorities would straight away get ten percent of the award. No, almost no questions asked because um, that's the amount that the government said they would never claw back, um, and and that would give them some seed capital effectively. But I think going forward, you'd you'd make that process a lot more, a lot less about the green book um, process, and a lot more power to local mayors and local politicians to make the right decisions for their local areas. And some of those local areas won't pass the green, local schemes won't pass the green book test. They might. You know, they might just be nice. Like it's quite hard to put the value on, a, on some trees and planters, etc. So the, the, these are the kind of things that you need to change if you're going to get it right. And Adam, with your um, with your streets ahead podcast hat on, um, obviously you, what well, was Laura Laker's kind of coup really, but um, the the interview that that she and you guys secured with Louise Hay was was very illuminating earlier this year, and since then, obviously we've had. Danny Williams appointed to lead the new integrated transport strategy, which is, you know, not only really recent news. I'm I'm assuming that, you know, you've you've got a bit of an in there and and hoping anyway that, you know, your your ideas and your thoughts are, are perhaps working their way in to the thinking around the integrated transport strategy. What what sorts of things would you like to influence in there, um, aside from the things that you've just talked about, which obviously is is key? Yeah, so I think I think that the noise, the mood music coming out of of the the department right now is is um, hugely promising, and uh, I, yeah, I really welcome uh, welcome that. I think uh, going back to the previous conversation I said about words versus budget, um, I think that's an important test and, and a test that we will soon hear about uh, and know the outcome of, um, but light and day difference you know to the point where i know people were trying to find ways to not mention the word cycling in the department for transport in case a, a conservative minister quashed it um to the point where now you know if you understand this stuff um you know you 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 ask for what you think and um uh, take louise hey the reason the reason she went on the podcast and read Laura's book is because she listens to the podcast. And I don't know how she started listening to the podcast, but she listens to to, to it basically. So I, I I at least know that there's there's a certain level of influence going in because because she she listens to the podcast. So um I mean all that stuff is super promising. Uh, I think there are some real ambitious stuff that they want to achieve. Uh, the fact they're talking about a road safety strategy, you know, we're one of the few developed nations without a road safety strategy. That's good. But I would really, I, I think it needs some real focused leadership because there are some very big things that the government needs to tackle. You know, they've just announced the HS2 oversight thing where the minister is going to keep an eye on costs. And, you know, those there's some big things going on in transport um and the thing with road safety you know, they had a round table event there's a lot of chat about how we keep car drivers safe from other car drivers which is an important part of road safety but it's definitely not the only part of road safety or road danger reduction so how do you make this stuff happen i think is is the question and, and the, the proof in the pudding because there's a lot of good chat and it's so refreshing to have good chat when the chat has been so negative for so long um but yeah the proof will be what happens and what comes next but there's some very good people danny is great to be leading that it's a it's a really it's a really important thing i think the integrated transport strategy is something that they really um they're really backing and believe i don't quite know what form it will take but certainly um that big on buses and if we can make this if we can make the connection about uh access to public transport nodes as well through walking and cycling you know you're in, you're ultimately increasing the the the, the catchment areas um uh, as, as well so um it feels positive but i think we should wait for for the budget and the spending review to see how positive it is and and, and hold people accountable accordingly yeah um right i'm going to rattle through a few sort of fairly 
not quite yes no answers uh, questions but perhaps we can go through them and then we'll see what questions anyone would like to ask you directly so um what's happening with the hs2 cycle path is it going ahead um my understanding is that that the work is still happening so they've they've hired somebody to uh, within the westminster Divine authority to um to, to kind of be the stakeholder coordinator um so uh that is positive um it relies on a variety of things uh, that all need to go right and in the favor you know i think but it's it's still proceeding um in in that way what it doesn't have is that you know it was an andy streets manifesto that it was going to you know be considered for funding it was going to be pushed it definitely hasn't got a figurehead like pushing it which it probably needs because there are competing demands on that space i think hs2 also quite fancy the idea of some sort of logistics things on the side and stuff like that so you've got to ring fence the space and in order to ring fence the space you need to be vocal so it's not not dead but needs not a dead. Needs yeah. someone to... and it probably needs some funding as well like a good yeah. way is if national government said you know you know the national cycle network could do with a revamp and something the government can get excited about why don't we launch the hs2 cycleway as part of the revamp of a national cycle network just just an idea um, are you doing any more Streets Ahead podcast episodes? Uh, yes, yes, I am. Uh, I've been away a little bit, um, but we are recording um, some soon. We're just all very busy. Ned's got a much more popular podcast that he does, um, <laughs> uh, which um, takes some time, and then he has a talk about some stuff. Uh, I think the next one we're going to do is we're going to go to Brighton and we're going to interview Sean Berry. Um, uh, as well, so I'm sure there'll be lots of interested folk here on that who I know are, 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 are locals. I've got Mark Strong on my on, on my screen, um, and um, uh, yeah, so so yes, will be great news. Um, going back up the list now, what about councils in areas without elected mayor mayors? Could they have commissioners? Yeah, there's nothing stopping them. Um, I think active travel England would would support them. Um, I think. Yeah, I, I, I really, it's it's a question of leadership. Like, do you have the leaders in place that want to do this? And if you do, and they need someone to run with it, then it's a great thing to have. If you don't have the leadership, I wouldn't advise getting a commissioner because they're just going to be frustrated and bored. Um, so, you know, get the leadership first and then get that leadership delegated to someone who can make it happen. Um, I. I often, when I first started, people said, oh, it's great having a commissioner, isn't it? I go, no, no, it's not. It's it's an admission that it doesn't work without someone pushing it. It's kind of an admission of, of failure. Yes, in the short term, it's a good thing. But find a way to make it happen, um, you know, automatically, ideally. And in the absence of that, find a way to get the leaders to, to, to push it in a big way and make it happen. And a few more on commissioner questions. So Dave asks... Should we in the East Midlands be concerned that the newly elected mayor proposes to appoint an AT ambassador rather than a commissioner? What's in the job title and are you available to write a job spec? <laughs> <laughs> um, I personally would, would be concerned if, if, if I... If, ambassador to me equals... And it's all fine, but it's just not the job that's needed, I don't think, in, in 2024. Ambassador to me equals going to, like have your photo taken outside some cycle parking or opening um school school um you know a school parking school cycle training or school street all this stuff is nice but actually you need to find a way well how do we deliver 50 or 100 or 150 school streets that's the kind of level of ambition so i'd say again it comes down to that level of detail and focus and it depends on the mayor as well some mayors are more standoffish you know and, and they let the executive just do their thing um andy was very 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 involved in the detail um and that that w worked for him so i wouldn't want to kind of poo poo it automatically but i'd be kind of asking is there the political will to make things happen and then is that role then empowered to go and make it happen and if it's an ambassador probably not Another question from another Adam. Do you think that um, individual local authorities within combined authorities should have to have individual capability assessments because they can potentially hide behind the overall CA le level assessment? 
I've asked that in a slightly different way than it was asked, but uh, yes, I, 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 I think, I think they should. I think probably the only reason they couldn't is because AT did not have the bandwidth to assess and co-assess like individually. Um, I think there are some authorities that hide behind more ambitious authorities, and actually, I run. You know, you take Coventry and Birmingham in my old patch, you know, both authorities I work really close with. Coventry have nowhere near as much political will as Birmingham, but they've actually got the delivery capability, you know, and they're actually delivering stuff. So those authorities probably shouldn't be, you know, under the same rating, or they might have the same rating, but for different reasons. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I think that should be the case. Question from Matthew in Darlington. How much of the delay to schemes do you think is down to LA officers not having the skills to design good schemes right in the first place? Um, the delays in my experience were down to um, the fairly laborious business case process. Sometimes um, a lack of understanding of what a good scheme looked like. Um, and most of all, actually, I think, so not, not the outcome, but the, the issue with the schemes is not so much the ability to design something, um, because most people who, who are qualified to do so can do so and they can follow the guidelines. Um, it's this little voice in the back of their head, which is like the cabinet member for transport or the local newspaper deciding what they can and can't do. Now, I found that mostly to be something that is purely in their head than actually something that existed. It was maybe just something for the West Midlands, we were very lucky. But what would happen is they would design a scheme that was substandard because they thought that if they did a better one, which maybe reduced the carriageway or reduced parking, their, their boss, the cabinet member or the leader of the council would never accept it. So there's no point even trying. Whereas actually when I had the conversation with some of those people, they were like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it properly. We want to lead it. We want to do it well. You know, I'll, I'll stand behind it kind of thing. Depends what part of the election cycle they're in, of course. But um, so, so often you deliver some, you design something substandard, you put out to consultation. It pleases no one because you've got the people who on the, on this chat who are like, it's rubbish and it, they're probably right. And you've got the people who don't want it anyway, who say it's rubbish because they're never going to be happy. And it won't achieve its goals because it doesn't get the mode shift it needs because it's not high quality or connected enough. So literally nobody wins. Um, so, you know, ultimately showing, setting the standard for what's accepted, but also what is right and what is politically salient and rising, raising that political will, I think is useful. The other thing that local authorities do do really badly and causes them loads of issues is, is consultation. So um, like I, I sometimes don't think more consultation is, is 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 helpful. I think sometimes we can overdo it. Sometimes you just can't make a decision. Some people like it, some people won't, and they can be judged at the ballot box. But um, the, uh, the, the handling, so often it's the traffic engineers doing parts, standing in a village hall, asking angry people what they think to the scheme without the tools to say, no, this is what it's for. And it's getting better, of course. But like when we do schemes, like we used to just send a screen grab of the CAD drawing and then say to the general public, well, what do you think? What do, you, do you like the curbs? Like what would, you know, no one, no one, I'll say no one normal, the, no general member of the public, I am interested in the curbs, but no general member of the public um, will have an opinion on that and needs it, needs visualization, needs handholding, needs maybe, you know, workshop. So they feel like they're part of it or maybe they do that co-design stuff. Um, so I think that's often where it falls down. I think Birmingham City Council have been consulting, reconsulting on their low traffic neighbourhood stuff for for what feels like years now. Um, and at some point, you've just got to do it. Thanks, Adam. Um, so if anyone would like to ask a question directly, do put your hand up. Um, we will have we've got another 15 minutes um, I'll I'll ask this one while, while anyone can think about whether they've got one or not, um, which is a question from David, which is, would, would you, do you have a kind of new and fresh understanding of what's 
involved in local government yes what's wrong with it but kind of did, did it give you was it an eye-opener and and you know what stayed with you and what what perhaps has helped you see also things from from a different perspective what surprised you yeah yeah um yeah I had a huge like accelerated apprenticeship in in the um in 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 local government um which I I'm hugely you know I I, I took a huge value because nothing happens without that working and it and it has been genuinely um I, I'm not trying to do hyperbole but probably decimated uh, over you know over recent years in terms of of, of um funding etc so there's a lot of very passionate good people trying to do their best sort of sat on their hands uh or or, or whatever and not being able to, to to have the full tools that they 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 need to to make a difference and we business cased everything so no longer covid was interesting right it was very very bad for lots and lots of reasons but it showed that if you wanted to actually if the state wanted to do something in an emergency and use its brain and you know they get some of it wrong but they got a lot of it right and you know to take the covid active travel funding you know we i've got councils that i work with that have not delivered a scheme for two years that managed to deliver a scheme that's probably a 50 percent of the technical difficulty in two weeks so they can do it um and uh i think i think that really um that really taught us something so i think giving more power to to local politicians um is good um I think Britain needs to, I don't know, it's gonna, I'm not going to be able to change this, but like Britain needs to lose its weird thing where everyone who works for the public sector needs to sort of suffer a little bit. Um, that's, you know, we we were in this like awful building, um, grandfathered rent, you know, it was just this awful building where it was cold and, you know, no one could see out the windows and, and it was just really bad. I'm like, this is our civic pride. Like, what have we, you know, what we've done that? So there's a few, a few things like like that. But ultimately, I think making it, giving more power to local decision makers, making less central, um, uh, you know, bureaucracy, uh, and letting, you know, letting people do, do the 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 right thing, and accepting that, you know, a lot of the time they'll get it right, and some of the time they, they won't, because even when we make them fill out massive business cases, people still get it wrong. So, you know, we should let people use their um, use their judgment more. Thanks. Um, Ian, we'll go to you first, then Robin, then Adam. All right. Thanks for that. Um, Adam, there aren't loads of uh, active travel commissioners. Um, hopefully there will be in the future. Here in South Yorkshire, we've gone for elite athletes. Uh, it sounds like you wanted to be an elite athlete, uh, but didn't quite get there. Um, so with your experience of the last past few years, what, what qualities do you think um, would make a good active travel commissioner? Thank you. Um, so I think an inquisitive nature, um, somebody who doesn't accept just what they're told. Um, my, my previous learning, so I'm just going to, uh, the it links, but the, the thing I forgot to say in the last question and the last answer was, um, I wish I trusted my judgment more. Um, I had this rapid integration into the public sector, but it was this kind of level of gatekeeping of like, no, you don't really get it. And actually the things that I said on the first week and the second week were the things that were right and that I wish I kept pushing on, even if it got uncomfortable. They actually, you know, it was, first thing I said, it was like the business cases, the processes, like, you know, this doesn't work. Uh, and my last week was effectively, you know, this <laughs> is the same story, um, but I just understood why they didn't work. Um, so trusting the judgment, I think, uh, linking to that, you know, it's that inquisitive nature um, and it's that passion and desire to to, to make change. Um, I'll be totally honest because I've, I've had this conversation with people who were athletes um, uh, and I've had it with Chris Boardman as well. That Chris is different because he's retired and, and long retired and, and, and a sort of different kettle of fish I guess but uh I actually used to think it was bad that they'd appoint athletes to this to this kind of role um and then I and that was just my gut reaction it wasn't based on anything other than I think I don't think that's what qualifies you to do it 
And I think it sort of sets the wrong tone of like cycling equals sport equal, you know, when actually it's just benign as, you know, cycling to the shops or in walking cases, being able to cross the road safely or whatever. So, um, however, uh, since working with um, Ed and um, Ed Fancy, Sarah Story, and others and and being involved in them they're, they're very kind they've they've set up a whatsapp group that says commissioners and friends now so i'm still in uh in the group um but they um they they they're athletes they they do something they test they learn they adapt and they do it to a to an absolutely relentless nature um and uh, you know, Ed doesn't fully understand how councils work yet. I know that I've had a chat with him. We talk quite regularly, but boy, like, you know, has he got a fire to, to, to do something about it um, and to try and make it better and make the system work better and bring people on board. So um, I think actually it's about getting the right people um, and they, but those inquisitive and improvement nature and that willing to kind of willingness to put your head above the parapet, I think is important important you've got to be willing to say this ain't good enough or we can do better um which i also think you know sometimes the public sector has has lost because they're afraid to admit that things could be better but in every part of business like when i'm from like we're constantly you know we we do these surveys where clients say how well they would recommend us and if we get an eight we're like well how can it be a nine um and and we need that across the whole of Bit of life, I think. Thank you, um, Robin. Yeah, if um, if we get got you an extra million pounds for active travel in the West Midlands, or an extra ten million pounds, make it unprecedented. Who knows? Would you spend it on infrastructure, behaviour change, road danger reduction, or something else? Um, I mean, it definitely depends if it's a million or ten million. So, which which is it? <laughs> a ten million. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think um, if it was, if I wanted to make a difference to people, vulnerable road users, people walking and cycling, and I had 10 million quid to do it, um, I would put, um, I would put 8 million into low cost, uh, no, 7 million to low cost, but high impact um, measures such as uh, low traffic neighbourhoods, if not school streets and areas that could potentially be grown into to, to, to wider low traffic neighborhoods. Um, I would put 500,000 or a million pounds of that funding activating that seven or eight million quid so that those in those areas, you know, we used to put money into our, like just random areas rather than actually areas where people might actually be in risk of riding a bike at some point. So um, we need to, we need to do that. Um, I would, put the rest of the money, uh, put some of the money into, see, I've, I've stopped quantifying it now. Um, I put some of the money into cycle hangers uh, in those areas as well. Um, and I would put the rest into bolstering third party reporting uh, with Westminster Police so that they can actually scale up um, at the moment, which is, at the moment they're just trying to keep their head above water um, using officers that are on long-term sick and stuff to who can't be on patrol doing the, the work in the office. It needs to be, you know more more considered than that yeah great definitely great answer thank you um adam um yeah this one's more to do with um going back to design and stuff like that where after travel england have got their design assurance and the design surgery stuff which they've announced and when we've spoken to or engaged with them it is very much a the council has to come to them to ask uh, to help for the help is um do you see possibly there a, a role for, say, the government to come in and say, look, if you want to spend this money, you have to have a design assurance sign off by Act of Travel England? Or do you or do you see it still being one of these things where, you know, those those councils that aren't interested, they're just not going to bother with for some time? Yeah, Um There's it's hard. There's a thing that Louise Hay said in that Hager said in the in the podcast, which I I sort of was slightly. It was the only bit that of the thing I was slightly worried about, which is that you know councils who have got the best teams or the best you know get to put the best bids together and get the most money, and that actually it should be spread 
equally. Um, but with limited funding, which you always know limited funding, even if the funding is increased, I am of the view you want to give it to the places that can make the most impact and make the most difference. And we need to make sure that it's equitable. Like I totally agree with that. We shouldn't just put it in leafy suburbs. Um, it needs to be in places with low car ownership and, and high health inequalities and, and things like that. Um, but if, if a city stands up and says, actually, I want to do this, then I think they should be supported. And I don't think cities or towns or, or county councils that don't want to do it should be given money just for turning up. Um, I don't I don't think that's, uh, well, I think they should get some money, but I don't think they should get as much money. Um, so therefore, you're in a situation where the ones that are most ambitious are generally the ones that ask for help. And they're the ones that go to active traveling and say, look, I want to be better. Can you help me? Because they know which which way is up they know which side the bread is buttered they know that if they make an effort and they can showcase this they can make the case for more funding and even at a combined authority level if there's any ever money left over from schemes that fall to the wayside then they're going to go straight to the councils who have proven they've got a track record in delivery of this stuff of, of high quality so i, I kind of think that it's in people's interest to ask for help um i know it doesn't always work like that um, and I think there are some good things that AT is doing, like with some, you know, I think they've got some active travel workshops, which we started in the West Midlands that are now being done in a lot of other areas. Again, I still feel like it's something you need to probably ask for. Um, so I do, I do think there are, uh, there are other ways to, to maybe get that engagement flowing, but I'm super mindful that they're a limited organization, you know, with, with, uh, limited by law, I think to 99 people um at the moment at least so um it's going to be hard for them to engage at a higher scale so it is sort of what it is for now but um it would be nice if it could be some of it could be more proactive outreach to lift those sort of lower authorities up um and maybe they've got like a program to identify those because i think it's in it, it's in the treasurer's interest right if you've got limited money that you spend some of that time making sure that the money is spent really well amongst you know across the country that would be that would be good so there is a definite argument for it right um this is you're going to need a big glass of water after this adam because you've been talking so much and it's been absolutely brilliant um i'm going to ask you one final question and then we'll wrap up it's an easy one i hope which is a uh, question from beth in torbay which was what kind of cyclist did you want to be and how many bikes have you got in your household um uh i wanted to be a a road cyclist um i did some good races like i i, I raced against people who went on and raced um uh in the tour de france and things like that the problem was i just finished like 37 um so i was i was at the age but i was the age of a junior just literally making up the numbers you know it's it was um but it was it was fun um how many bikes have in our household we have um we have about six or seven i have had more i've sold quite a few of them um my favorite one is uh i've got a big cargo bike and that's the one i ride most of the time um and i've got my kids on the front of it and uh yeah it's all very nice well that that's a lovely image to end with adam and thank you so much for joining and um speaking so candidly about uh the challenges, the opportunities, the ideas, and um, we're all about sharing here. And I think a lot of what you've said has been really useful. Um, I hope, you know, that we see you again in some guys in the future, and, you know, seem to have so much to offer. So I hope you get, you know, to work in the system somewhere or with, with many different hats. So a reminder, everyone, that next week um, we're on a break. So... Yeah, please join me in thanking Adam in, in the chat or with your thumbs up. Um, reminder, next week we're on a break, so we won't be here, but we're back on Tuesday the 5th of November, fireworks night, um, when we've got uh, Greg Marsden, the professor from Leeds University Transport Studies Unit. He's a renowned expert uh, in the field of sustainable transport, and he's doing working on a project to envision what a car-free city might be be like and he's got um some some challenges that he'd like to set anyone who joins so i think it might be a, an interactive session so thank you adam and have a good half term everyone and see you on the 5th of november <laughs>